Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this latest teaching session in the course on technology and the future of medicine. Today, Patrick Polarski is taking us through automating life, the automated past, present, and future of human life on Earth. Take it away, Pat. Short people have to tell you about very large subjects. So today's topic is, in fact, automating life. This will be the automated past, present, and future of not just your life, but everyone's life. And I'm going to give you a, a short snapshot today of that. Uh, this is actually a, a, a redo of a talk I gave at the Ernest C. Manning Celebration of Innovation at TELUS World of Science last fall. And I thought it might be very appropriate given the, the lectures you've already had on machine intelligence. I, I know Osmar has taken you through uh, some of the other promises and perils of artificial intelligence. So what I'm going to do is give you what's probably a shorter lecture than you've had for the rest of the course. And at the end, we actually have a, an audience participation section. So we're, I'm going to try and cut early, and we'll actually go to you guys and have, a, have an exercise. But we'll start out first with, with, the, with the title of my talk here, which is, is automation. I mean, I, I, normally I would have worn a suit for this, because automation is something that is so fundamental and so important to not just how you live your life, but how you will live your life in the days to come, that, that I should have dressed up more than I did. But I, I assure you this, this shirt will have to do for the, the importance of the topic. So in, automation is very important because of complexity. This is one of the key ideas that I hope you go away with today, is that automation helps human life deal with some of that amazing complexity in the world. So here you see on, on the slide, I've showed you a number of little gears all meshing together. And I hope by the end of this, you'll start to see how those gears actually reflect things you know about in, in everyday life. So I'm going to start out by presenting you with a very exciting and a very important form of automation. So what, maybe, maybe robotics. We'll talk about robotics today. We'll talk a little bit about machine intelligence. We'll talk about artificial intelligence and other buzzwords that you probably have heard. But first, um, when I say automation, what do you guys think of? Shout out some things that you think of when I say automation or maybe robotics. Yeah. Machines, yeah, 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 machines usually automate things for us, right? I mean, we'll see some examples of factories, so machines of all different kinds. The whole point is automating something, and we'll get to that. Even, even the simple machines, very good point. Uh, someone else shout something out. Bank What's that? Bank machine. Bank machine. Yeah, it's an automated teller, right? It actually has automated right in the name. That's a great example. All right, one more example. One more example of something that's automated. Could be far-fetched. Could be from science fiction. Some of you must read science fiction. Fiction's important. So a very, very important form of automation, a very, very important, impressive robot is, is this. What is that? Looks like a stick. It's a stick. It's a stick. It's fantastic. This it's is a one stick. Of the most, yeah. It's, yeah. Okay. This is one of the most impressive forms of automation many of you have ever seen. And it's a stick. Well, you don't believe me. Okay, you think you're going to go home and tell everyone. You'll tell your spouse and your friends. You'll be like, oh, yeah, I saw this lecture by a guy today, and he said that the most impressive robot out there was a stick. Sticks are robots. Do you guys know that? Sticks are robots. Okay, but let's, let's just back up a second here, and we'll look at our friend the stick here. Um, so what do sticks do? And what have sticks done for us in the past? Well, something a stick does is it allows us to multiply the force that we can leverage on the world, right? You think of like a basic, like a club. Look at the dawn of warfare. What did people use to beat each other with? Probably sticks and bones and other long objects that were heavy. So a stick gives us the ability to multiply the force that we can exert on the world. You think of like a lever. Again, goes back to the comment earlier about machines and simple machines in particular. Also, remote actuation. Stick lets us extend our reach into the world. If you know there's like something on the other side of a fence, there's something else you want to get, you can sort of poke a stick through there and try and pull, it toward, pull, pull the object towards you. So, a stick is also a way of, of performing something like remote actuation. Sticks extend our reach. They automate some aspect of our daily life. Now, you probably are all thinking this is ridiculous. And why are you talking about sticks? This is supposed to be about the perils of machine intelligence and things. OK. Is this more what you were expecting? Yeah, that's more. You were expecting me to talk about something like this why I said automation and robots, right? This is a classic example of automation. In fact, it's one of the things that usually springs to mind. In this case, it's a car factory. It's the Toyota car factory in, uh, just outside of Nagoya, Japan. Right? So this is when we think of automation, usually we think of these big robot arms moving at high speed on a factory floor. And they're welding, and they're painting, and they're you know, zipping bolts into the car chassis. 
So usually, when we think about automation, we think about something like this, these, these particular kinds of robots. If you all, you've all seen these? Has anyone seen one actually in the, well, not in the flesh, but actually, actually working in, a, in, in real life? Anybody? Oh, if you get a chance, it, it's quite impressive, because these, these are not small things. These, these kinds of machines are actually quite large. They automate all number of tasks. And uh, in particular, if you even go to any of our, we're Alberta, so of course we have a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, food production here, in, in particular beef packaging and things. And recently in one of the beef packaging plants, you can see a very large factory robot like this, which is taking all the boxes, moving them at high speed, and sorting them onto pallets, and actually getting them ready for shipping out. So these robots are very impressive to see in operation. They have big steel cages around them, so you don't lose a body part when you're near them. We'll get to replacing body parts later, don't worry. Uh, but these are the kind of factory robots that we usually think of. And in particular, you can see this, this one here is just, it's bolting a transmission into the bottom of a car. So that's something that people used to do, right? I mean, most of these basic operations, the welding, this car just came out of a series of robots that actually painted the whole car, put the entire clear coat and, and all the enamel on top of that car. But usually you would see some of these very, in some cases, very complex tasks like mounting all the mechanical parts of a car inside that chassis and fixing them all in. That was something that was traditionally done by hand and in this particular setting has been automated by a machine. All right, so I, this is all, again, these are all pictures from, uh, from out, at, out at Toyota. Uh, Toyota became Toyota. Anyway, um, this is all from Toyota. Does anyone know what, what uh, Toyota started with? It wasn't automobiles. Oh, it wasn't even bicycles. It was Honda. Honda. That, that's very possible. Toyota had something very different. It involved wheels, though. Toys? No, it wasn't toys either. Anybody? What's that? Farming equipment. Almost. Almost. What was this? They started in textiles. They started in automating the process of spinning and weaving, of making fabrics out of base materials. And if you go to their museum, it's actually really, it's, it's worth a trip out there if you get a chance to go to the museum because they'll show you about the, all the stuff about making cars. But much more exciting is the history of automation that's built into how they went from a simple system like this, a, a spinning wheel that takes animal fur and plant matter and builds things like thread and yarn and eventually if you go to the factory, you'll see how it integrates all those together into incredibly complex textiles. And you can see step by step how every little piece of the process of making fabric was gradually increased in speed, increased in efficiency. Small pieces were taken over by more and more complex machines. All right? This is the history. I, I really like it because I do think it is the history of automation. And we went from those spinning wheels to something like this. If you can see on the screen, it's a battery of all these of different, uh, of different fibers being woven together and being dressed, stretched out and drawn. And it's nice to see this progression, how you went from someone manually operating a wheel and drawing thread out by hand to a machine that does that, to a machine that then has a shuttle firing back and forth to begin to weave textiles together, to an air-fired shuttle that goes many thousands of times a second and prints in 16 colors to make you a, uh, a piece of fabric or a towel that looks like Mickey Mouse. Like, that's an incredible progression in what amounts to a very short time. And this is the kind of automation that we're going to talk about for the rest of my time chatting with you. And we'll see how this extends not to just factory settings, but to automating all the things that are even more close and more intimate to what we consider human life. So this is where we're going, right? So if we look, we went, from the, we went from a stick, we went to the Toyota factory, and now we have, uh, anyone seen The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, or even better, read the books? Good. OK, then you remember Marvin, the paranoid android. He says, here I am, brain the size of a planet, a, a pinnacle of machine intelligence, a pinnacle of automation, automating not just physical actions, but also intellect. All right? So this is where we're going. And maybe, maybe some of you also remember this little guy. Has anyone seen, uh, seen this, Wally? Yeah? One of the cutest movies. My wife and I love this movie. This is a, a great example of automation as well. And uh, in particular, it represents what I like to call social automation. All right? So Marvin, you saw on the previous slide, and Wally here, they interact in a social setting. They perform in sort of a, they, they automate some aspects of the interaction between two entities. Uh, so is this pretty far-fetched though, right? We don't, does anyone see an example of something like Wally in daily life? We see pieces of this, right? And in fact, let's look at this little guy in particular. We have something that looks like this. That's, that's not too far removed, right? 
This is a robot at a shopping mall, one of the shopping malls in Japan. A lot of my examples will be from Japan, because it is one of the uh, homelands of automation. And what you see here is actually a robot babysitter. So this little robot is actually stationed at a mall, and you can imagine leaving your little child with this robot. It has a little name tag, the robot can scan it, make sure your kid doesn't get lost or run over by something. And so yeah, parents could just come in, you know, drop off a child with the robot, and the robot would act as sort of a robot nanny while the parents go shopping. That's, that's great, right? Would you guys leave your children with a robot babysitter? Does any of you have children? Just checking. You do? Would you leave your child with a robot babysitter? You're not sure? See, I, I have a new puppy. We just got a puppy recently. My wife and I got a puppy. And I, I'm, I'm not convinced we'd leave our puppy with a robot babysitter, but only because the puppy would probably chew the robot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's another great example of, of help, machines helping manage social settings. And the, the robot, I'm assuming the robot, they were helping the children interact or, yeah. Yeah, there's some neat examples of, of robots that the, the little keep on robot as well, a little or, a series of little sort of like, looks like an ice cream cone of yellow, um, is a great example of, of one that deals with children, for instance, with the autism, autism spectrum and all the other different uh, ways of interacting. These robots can help encourage them to make eye contact, to be able to hone their social skills. So this is a neat example. We're looking at automating some social aspects of human life. All right, and if this robot seems a little far-fetched, then maybe let's look at, let's look at these robots. Yeah. Those are some of the geminoid robots of uh, Hiroshi Ishiguro. And uh, you may notice that, I mean, you can probably tell one of those is a human and one of those is a robot, right? You guys can, can you all tell which one's the robot? Can anyone not tell which one's the robot and which one's the human? They're getting close, right? So this is actually like, on first pass, something in your brain, something very far down in your primitive animal brain will probably say, oh, that doesn't look quite right. Doesn't look quite human. And you're probably right to, to hone that intuition. But uh, what you see here is a, is a level of automation where they actually have duplicates of these particular actors. And I believe these are actually used in a TV show. And uh, what the actors will do is, is sort of remote pilot their, their synthetic bodies. It's kind of like you yeah, guys saw the movie Avatar, probably big blue things running around. Um, people projecting themselves into a synthetic body. And here we're seeing an example of this as well, where people are, in fact, being able to teleoperate duplicates of themselves, except duplicates that are made out of plastics and metals, as opposed to squishy wetware. So this is interesting as well. This is another form of automating things that we, we near, normally hold near and dear as something very human. Our appearance, our social interaction, their voices come out of the mouths of these robots. It's a very interesting setting. OK. But let's get even closer. I, we talked about social automation or automating some of the, the more touchy-feely or the, the me-to-you aspects of, uh, of daily life. So how about we actually look now at a more direct form of automation, automating parts of our body, looking at the direct connection between ourselves and between machines and our nervous tissue, our muscles, the different aspects that allow us to interact with our world. Uh, one example that I really like to bring up all the time is Amy, Mull uh, Amy Mullins. Amy Mullins is a pretty spectacular individual. She has an excellent TED talk. If you guys get a chance, go. It's, I think it's Amy Mullins and her many amazing sets of legs or something like this. Wonderful talk. I encourage you to, uh, to listen to that talk and watch it as an example of abilities and super abilities. Um, but Amy, Amy lost, as you can see, Amy lost both of her, uh, both of her legs as a child. She had uh, both legs removed down there about, I think it's about the shin level. Um, and went on to become not only a supermodel, but a world-class sprinter. I believe she did defense work at the Pentagon. Amy's done amazing, many, many amazing things. And this example here, you see she has those cheetah recurve legs, those like carbon fiber legs, that allow her to run at incredible speeds. Now, there's nothing really electron, these aren't like electromechanical wonders. They are simple but elegant mechanical systems which allow Amy to extend her abilities through some kind of mechanical operation, some kind of mechanical enhancement. This is quite profound. Even purely mechanical machines, I, I showed you a stick earlier. This goes back to another example of, of, of systems like the stick automating aspects of our life, in this case, sprinting and running. But let's go even farther forward. So we look at Amy Mullins. Uh, Amy is a great example. But we have Zach here. So you see that Zach has something very different from Amy's cheetah recurve legs. Zach here is actually using a full electromechanical leg. So Zach Vodder was a, is a subject working with the folks at the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago. And Zach and his leg, let's call them together, we'll call them Zach, 
climbed all, I think it's 111 flights of stairs of the Chicago Willis Tower as part of a fundraiser. And that's Zach up at the top of the tower there. Um, and what's neat is that Zach has a, a full, his leg has a powered ankle and knee, and he controls it just by thinking about moving it. So there, he's undergone some very interesting uh, re innervation surgeries that allow him to, by moving his, the leg that he's lost, just thinking about moving it like he normally would, he can flex and bend his knee and actually move the synthetic part of his body like he'd move the natural part of his body, or at least a first approximation. That's fairly incredible. We're starting to automate not just mechanically, but also automate the whole process of thinking through to moving a leg. This is, so this is Zach Vodder. Um, now, some of you may know this kind of, uh, maybe some of you know this example. This is one of my favorite video game franchises, the, uh, the Metroid video game franchise. Uh, and this is the same with Zaran in a fancy cyber suit, you know, like a suit that enhances her ability. She can, like, jump off walls and things and do little spin jumps, roll through a ball and roll through tiny tunnels. So, I mean, this also is something that for a very long time has seemed very far-fetched, the ability to enhance our strength, to accentuate our ability to interact with the world on a, on a very comprehensive level. The last quote I saw was like soldiers could actually carry packs that weigh in excess of 300 pounds at a, at a pretty good long march. So that's already incredible. There's, uh, there's examples you as well see where people who are paralyzed are strapped into exoskeletons. Let's call them exoskeletons because that's a good way of, of sort of framing this. People who've been paralyzed are actually bolted into exoskeletons and they can use that to, to move around even though they can't actually move the lower parts of their body. Uh, this is pretty incredible as well. And going back to our, our friends in Japan, this is the, the HAL suit, the hybrid assistive limb. I saw uh, an example of this at a conference uh, last, last summer in Japan, actually, um, made by Cyberdyne Incorporated from up in Scuba, Japan, just, just north and sort of up in Chiba. And uh, this is a great suit as well. It, it monitors what someone's doing. So not a paralyzed person in this case, but monitors what this person is doing and essentially uses its motors to help enhance their abilities. So you can imagine. There's, there's some great impacts for this. One is that you could have, say, someone who has motor impairments, or even Japan has a rapidly aging population, allow the elderly to put on these suits before going out and continue to perform some of the tasks of daily life while they're out there interacting with the world. So suits like this can help them regain the strength they may have lost, or it could, for instance, help caregivers who are attending to people who are sick in bed be able to have the strength to lift people out of beds and put them in their wheelchairs or move them from one bed to another. So these suits are enhancing and augmenting the strength and the ability to interact with the world of the people who wear them. Um, here's an example as well where the suit has been modified for disaster recovery. You can see the same thing here. Someone in like a, uh, a disaster recovery kit and someone else carrying a very large box. So we do have suits now that are augmenting and enhancing our physical abilities. And a key example of enhancing or augmenting physical abilities is, is actually what we do with our upper limbs. So walking is one thing. I've showed you examples primarily of walking so far, but um, something near and dear to my heart, I work mostly in assistive robotics and rehabilitation technology, specifically upper limb prosthetics, robotic electromechanical devices to replace the function for someone who's lost a body part, particularly an upper limb. And there are some spectacular examples of prosthetic systems that are just now being developed in research labs. And some of them even, like the, the deck arm on the bottom right there, is actually being now certified by the FDA for, for eventual sale to, to people who need it. So these are some of the state of the art. What I'm showing you in the slide here are some of the state of the art in electromechanical limbs. I'll show you examples, but they have upwards of 20 degrees of freedom, 20 different independent things they can move. And they begin to very closely mirror some of the natural biological movements of the human body. Um, here's one example. So the video I'm showing you now is an example of uh, the modular prosthetic limb from the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. And you can see that this is a person with a data glove. So the person is in this picture here is, has a mo essentially a, a motion recording apparatus on their body. And they're using that to essentially pilot or teleoperate this robotic limb. And as you can see from the video, they're actually the limb is mirroring very closely the motions being made by the person using it. To the, to the extent of being able to spread the fingers, pinch grips. If we keep this video going for a couple of seconds, you'll also see that the person will begin to open bottles with it. They'll use tools. They'll remove clothespins from a line. So th the robot arm itself is automating many of the functions that a normal human arm would be able to, to accomplish. And this arm here is, of course, not attached to the person. It's mounted to a desk and it's accomplishing these tasks. You can imagine very easily mounting this to a human body. And I'll show you this on the next slide. But, but first, let's just have a look here and actually, uh, actually watch. So he's picking up the bottle with his hand. He's going to unscrew the top of the bottle here. There you go. With his other hand. One of his other hands. He has many hands. All right, good. So this is, 
the, this is this particular Bajra prosthetic limb being controlled by someone who has all of their body parts, right? Someone who has all of their biological normal function, but this is extending that into another space. Here is an example of that, of a very similar kind of limb, this, uh, the DECA, the de one of the DECA arms being controlled by um, another subject from the rehabilitation in Chicago. And here you can see that this arm now, as opposed to being mounted on a desk or a stand, is actually mounted to Jesse's arms here. So he's actually got it, he's a, he lo a lineman, lost both of his, his upper limbs at the shoulder due to an electrical accident. And now he's actually controlling using the same way, the same way that Zach was controlling that leg I showed you earlier, he's controlling this arm to perform a series of motion, albeit sequential. He's moving usually one joint only at any given time. He's using this arm to begin to interact with the world and replace the function from the arms that he lost. It's fairly miraculous. You can see here a full electromechanical arm that's mounted at the shoulder. Again, Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago. So he's controlling this by signals that are being read off the muscles of his body. You also see examples, and some of you may have seen this example already as well, uh, some of the brain gate work. But here's a, another subject, Jan Schurman. Jan is paralyzed from the neck down, can't move her body. And if you can look very closely at the video here, if you look very closely at the slide, you'll see there's two gray plugs coming out of the top of Jan's head. Those are brain implants. So essentially, what they've done is implant a microchip on the, t on the surface of Jan's brain, and those connect through the skull to those gray plugs. And she's using them to control that same arm I showed you in the, in the previous slide. So she's actually, by thinking, controlling a bionic limb to perform tasks. There's a paralyzed woman directly through a brain interface controlling a bionic limb, automating her physical tasks or enhancing and projecting her thoughts out into the physical world. Here we'll see she's feeding herself a chocolate bar, and if we kept going, you'd see her eating silly string and uh, cheese and things and eating, eating a red pepper, I think. But this is another fantastic example of automation. OK, now those were, very, those were research grade arms I just showed you. These are, are arms that you wouldn't be able to go out and actually purchase if you were someone who'd lost a limb. These are still, still in the research and development phases, although they're getting very or a lot closer to being actually out there in the world. Uh, but there are examples of still very powerful bionic limb systems that are seeing use every day. So I, uh, here's a couple of examples. You can see that someone is using these particular bionic limbs to tie their shoelaces, pour themselves a drink, or write. These are arm systems that you can actually get prescribed and can actually have if you were someone who's lost a limb. There's bionic elbows, there are hands with many different grip patterns. There's limitations to how people can currently control these devices and how many functions they have. It won't be nearly as fluid as that limb I showed you earlier on. But people are using systems like this in everyday life already. And that's fairly spectacular. Here's some examples, again, of uh, these are some examples from, from our lab, actually, from my lab. And you can see here is one very uh, kind subject who we've actually mounted an experimental robot arm onto, onto his arm. And he's picking up a series of small objects controlling this arm. Uh, there's a uh, hand up in the top right that we've developed through rapid prototyping. Uh, all these systems are developed such that not just that we can automate the motor function, but they're designed so that they can actually enhance many other aspects. My lab studies machine intelligence. We study the automation of not just mechanical systems, but thought. And so what we're trying to do is allow some of these bionic systems to begin to take on a bit of a life of their own, automate some of the decision making to actually accentuate the ability of the users, to allow those users to better interact with their world through a shared decision-making process. And so these robotic systems are doing just that. That's what, how we develop our robot arms. Now, remember earlier I, uh, I talked to you about sticks. You laughed at me. You said sticks aren't robots. I said sticks are a force multiplier. They allow you to increase the ability to actually exert force on the world. And remote actuation, they allow you to begin to extend your reach in the world. Well, if you think about it, limbs are those same kind of things. Limbs are like sticks with benefits, and that they also allow us to multiply the force, multiply the force of our intent into the world and actuate things that are farther away from ourselves. And when we talk about moving farther away, we're also doing other forms of automation in my lab. One thing we're looking at is, is uh, something called the, uh, the, what we call the go-go gadget wrist. But essentially, we're looking at an extendable, uh, extendable telescoping prosthetic arm, such that you could imagine my arm doesn't really stretch out very well, right? It's all flesh and bone. It's pretty much fixed in length. But if this arm were lost, there's all this real estate here. We could begin to develop systems that do things that aren't inherent in a biological limb. 
One example is, is what I'm showing you right now on the screen, which is this extendable forearm prosthesis. Very simple system whereby you could imagine allowing your forearm to telescope out to, say, reach out towards the cup over there or down to something you just can't reach. This is something that people with augmentative technology can begin to use that a normal biological person may not have. It's an acquired ability through automation and through technology. So what have we talked about so far? We've really talked about this setting here. This is a more general case now. I put a cartoon on, on the screen now. But this is the general case. We have the human body. We're measuring many signals from that human body and putting many signals back in to that human body. On the other side, we have some kind of robot, some kind of automated system or some kind of machine, as was mentioned earlier. And again, that machine has many signals flowing into it and signals flowing out of it. What we're talking about here is ways that you can begin to glue those two pieces together. Automate the entire process of interacting with the world by attaching some kind of automated mechanical system to all those signals of the human body, making some mated pair between the inputs and outputs of the human body and the robotic system that's attached to it. Or, even more generally, think of it like this. We're looking at finding ways to take all those signals flowing in and out of the human mind, the human will, and connect that to, here I mention a synthetic body, but really to any kind of body, to any kind of technology that allows us to interact with our world. This is the general case we're talking about. And I've showed you examples from social automation, from the actual actuation and the automation of, of human processes to mechanical processes. There's other kinds of automation we haven't even talked about yet. We haven't talked about cognitive automation. Automating some of the things that we hold very close to ourselves. I showed you that picture of the human mind. Some things we hold very close are our ability to think and to reason. And, and one thing that really we, we think very hard on is, that, is translation. Some of you, this was for a very long time, was one thing that was seen to be very inherently intellectual or cognitive. The ability to translate meaning, intent from one language to another. This is something that is very fundamental to what many people consider intelligence. And really, I went on here to make this slide, I went on to Google. And I went into Google Translate, and I typed in maple syrup is not a robot, and I got the, I got the, the corresponding text in Japanese, along with another a link of, of lists for other things that might help me translate. So right away, this is something that probably all of you use on a regular basis. This is a form of cognitive automation, intellectual automation. Google does a lot of this for us. Not just translating words from one language into another word, language, not just translating meaning from one language to another language, but even searching. If you think of searching, the act of searching is also a very intellectual activity. Being able to sort through massive amounts of information and finding just the right thing. Being able to sort of partition off some subset of knowledge that might be important. This is also a very intellectual activity. And we use, most of us use Google search on a very regular basis. Does everybody, has everyone used a search engine before? An internet search engine? Yeah, I, I have. I use it to make the slide. Otherwise, I, I wouldn't have the slide. Uh, and everyone's used, who's used a trans, an automated translation system like this? Yeah. Yeah, most of you probably have. And if not, you can actually, uh, you can use the Google search to find a human translator. So this is one example of cognitive or intellectual automation. So it's not just physical kinds of automation. You know, the standard factory robot putting bolts in a hole and welding something. This is actually automating some of our intellectual or cognitive processes. Uh, you probably also use this kind of automation. I mean, just understanding speech, that's fairly, that's fairly fundamental to what we do as, as, as intelligent beings, right? Uh, who, who has a smartphone? You guys have smartphones? Yeah, a couple of you have. Most of you, yeah, okay, so you're like, oh, I'm sleeping in my arms, and I'm going to actually raise my hand too. Yeah, yeah. So many of us, many people have smartphones or smart devices of some kind, and uh, for instance, you could just press your Siri button or your Google Talk button or whatever you choose, and you'll be able to say, okay, I'd like to find out about baking squid pancakes. And it'll say, okay, give me a second here. First of all, it knows that you're asking about squid pancakes, at least if you speak clearly. And then it goes off into the interwebs and finds you some recipes for baking squid pancakes. And you could even say, OK, that's great. I was talking to my mom about this. And it says, great, I'm texting your mom a re recipe about baking squid cakes. Uh, do you want me to send it? So really, what's your phone doing? What's your smart device or your computer doing? It's automating the role of an assistant. Something else we think being like an executive assistant or administrative assistant, this is a very high level function that you're actually beginning to manage large amounts of information, sort, prioritize tasks, be able to carry out or execute functions for another person. And this is also something that's very human and very intellectual. 
And this is now something that's also being automated in some settings. This is quite impressive. So what have we looked at so far? It's not just the automation of physical aspects. We're looking at finding ways to link the human mind. This is what human, that's what human culture has been doing for, for the very recent past and the very distant past. We've been finding ways to take our will or take our intent and automate some aspects of that, stretch that out into the world to interact better, to control more of our world, to be able to understand more of our world. Automating small processes and helping us to be able to better link to that vast sea of everything that's out there. This is, the, this is really the history of automation. And uh, it gets us back to our friend Marvin here. So we, again, we said Marvin is the pinnacle of automation, but with cognitive automation, social automation, at least to, to some degree, anyone who's actually, again, read the books will know that Marvin's social automation is perhaps not always the, uh, the best, thanks to the particular cybernetics corporation in question. And uh, also physical automation. Remember, here I am taking prisoners to the, taking prisoners to the bridge. Uh, he's automating physical tasks and mental tasks. Now, is this, is this odd? Is this strange? Is this terrifying? I mean, when dealing with this complexity, this level of automation is something that is almost essential and maybe always has been essential. So is automation in contrast to human nature? Is automation at odds with nature? This is a key question. What do you guys think? I mean, you think, let's think of Marvin back there as well. I mean, that's a, a form of automation that may have choices. And even those mechanical systems that we looked at earlier may have choices. I'm not, I'm not agreeing or disagreeing. I, I'm saying it's, it's where you put the choice, where you put the decision making or the autonomy into the systems. A control system on a very fundamental level is making decisions about which way to go. You're giving it suggestions and it's trying to comply, much like Siri or any of these other things. So it's a very, it's a hard line to draw. So I'm glad you brought that up. Okay. Well, I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm going to wrap up then and we'll get into a bit more of a discussion after the fact. Uh, but Perhaps one thing to leave, one thing to think about, is that maybe nature's been automating all along. Maybe nature is, in its very essence, a, a process of automation. And finally, maybe humanity is just getting to the point where we can play along and actually keep up. Maybe we're starting to play our part in that automation. And all the technology I showed you is maybe part of that natural process. So that gets us back to our, our friend here, the stick, and, uh, and the history of automation. So with that, I'm going to wrap up. And I close. Uh, thank you all very much for listening so far. And if you'll indulge me, then we'll move on to a uh, to a brief exercise where we each of you will actually get to have your have your say in things. Thanks so much. But uh, first off, I'm just going to do two things. One thing I usually do at the beginning, but in the interest of uh, of flow, I decided to to pass up on is I want to know what your backgrounds are. I know some of your backgrounds. I know what some of you do in your research life and things. But uh, maybe could you just quickly go through and say a little bit about what, what field you're in, what you're studying, maybe what your graduate or undergraduate degree is currently in? Hi, my name is Kira. Um, I'm currently in my fourth year um, finishing a science degree. Um, my major is bioscience, and my minor is English. Um, but right now I'm taking an uh, interest in global health, so you could say that's my area of interest. Not necessarily my field, but where I hope to be at some point. Hello. my. My name is Rahel, and I'm an undergraduate neuroscience student. And um, yeah, global health is also um, my area of interest, including, uh, but also neuroscience research. Hello, my name is Lucian. I'm an undergraduate in chemistry, minor in economics. And I would say my interests lie pretty much uh, in all fields of science. My name is Michael. I did my undergraduate degree with focus on immunology and infectious diseases, and I went on to do my master's degree here, uh, applying that to transplantation medicine. So I'm looking at kidney transplant rejection and the role that the immune system plays in that. Hmm. My name is Francesco. I did both my bachelor and my master's degree in um, biomedical engineering. And now I am an, a PhD student in the Department of Physics here at the University of Alberta. And my interest is in um, cancer research and drug design. Uh, my name is Yan Lan. Um, I did my undergraduate study and master's study in China. I'm a medical school student in China. And now I am uh, in the Department of Surgery. This is my first year for my PhD. Mm. And my research is about uh, using the stem cells and scaffolds to 
you know, for tissue engineering, for the miniscus, something like that. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Anchor Banerjee. I'm a third year student in neuroscience. And my interest is more on where the future of medicine is headed and how it'll be applicable to the average person rather than global health in general, per se. Hello, my name is Rossi. I'm a graduate student at the Department of Surgery. And my interest in, in um, the perception of surgeons during, during minimally invasive surgery. Thank you. Hi, I'm Wen Jing. I'm also in the same lab as Zosi. Uh, my project is on the DRI tracking for the assessment of team co cooperation of surgeons. Great. Okay. So thank you. That was everybody. I think we got everyone. Okay. Good. So thank you. We have a broad, a broad cross section of people with different interests and different backgrounds and different ways that that the kinds of things we've hopefully you've talked about so far in the course are all going to impact all of your fields quite profoundly. Um, in particular, I know Osmar Zain, Dr. Zain, one of my colleagues, came and gave you uh, three lectures so far. Is that correct? Yeah, did, did everybody see at least one of those? Yeah? And what did, what did Osmar teach you, or share with you, or show you? Or... Um. <laughs> so we talked a lot about artificial intelligence and where we, um, he, uh, spoke to us about uh, the very beginning of artificial intelligence and how far it is heading. And um, it seems like uh, the artificial intelligence world is changing in astronomical rate. So we talked a little bit about that. OK, good. So good. OK, so now I know. I, I, I kind of knew what Osmar told you already, but I want to hear what, what you guys interpreted it as. Um, so then someone else, good job. You're off the hook now. Um, someone else defined for me then. Artificial intelligence, or machine intelligence, if you prefer to use that, that terminology. And there's a third harder question, so someone jump on this one first, because otherwise you have to take the last one. I have no idea. I wasn't here for the other lectures. But to me, it would seem like uh, intelligence created by humans. Anybody else? Everyone's uh, quickly. Someone, someone's probably using Google now to look up definitions of artificial intelligence, aren't you? You're well, automating uh, your question answering. My impression is, is a kind of intelligence that is able to uh, develop its knowledge by itself without the human uh, uh, help. I mean, the human help at the beginning, but then it's able to evolve by itself. This is my, pretty much my impression. Okay, yeah. good, good, good. Okay, now the hard question. Oh, someone else want to answer in the, or before the hard question? You're all trying to jump on this one before I ask you a harder question. Okay, good. Um, I guess for me, what really separates artificial intelligence from everything else is the ability to adapt. Mm -hmm. Is that a, you know, that's what really separates humans from, I guess, trees or something. Uh, is that uh, humans can adapt to challenges, and I think that's what's really needed to create artificial intelligence is uh, machines that can adapt to unforeseen or unprogrammed circumstances. Good, good, good. Okay, so good. And that actually will jump into the last part of my question because you uh, probably began to address for it. For me, artificial intelligence uh, probably is just like thinking machine, a machine that can think, analysis, or something like that. But uh, probably beyond humans' intelligence. So, <laughs> okay. Good. Okay, so um, you've got the mic, and now I'm going to ask you the hard question. So oh. what, are three, what, are, what are a few things that really are key components of artificial intelligence? We're here at adaptation, the ability to adapt. So can you rattle off maybe three more things that are hallmarks of or key components of AI? And you can give what you think AI and machine intelligence is too. First, I was thinking that um, artificial intelligence is something that is created from, from human and that is supposed to mimic um, human behavior, human thinking, way of thinking. So the key components could be um, something that should be defined to closely follow these patterns of human behavior or movements or anything that's connected with the human. OK, good. So in the interest of time, we're going to move on to the next phase. So for me, I'll just give you, I'll share a little bit about um, my view on machine intelligence and some of the pieces of it, because I, I know that it may overlap with, what, with some of what Osmar told you, and some of it may be different. But uh, to me, machine intelligence or synthetic intelligence of any kind, and intelligence in general, revolves around really three big things. There's many things, but three big things. 
One of them is the ability to represent the world. The ability to take and structure the information in the world in a, in a fruitful way. Another aspect is the ability to predict, anticipate, or forecast aspects of that knowledge, aspects of that information. It's the ability to essentially not just see the future, but be able to build up and maintain knowledge of a predictive form of whatever is out there in the world. And, and the last aspect is the ability to control some aspect of the world. Bringing all, all three of those things together is, I think, a nice, a nice concrete package for intelligence, and specifically machine intelligence. And it involves things like adaptation, being able to adapt and change. Machine learning is a key part of that. It also em embodies things like complexity, how you manage a very complex or all-encompassing kind of world. And it also is how you deal with uncertainties or unknowns. Intelligence is able to deal with uncertainties and unknowns. So with that as your, as your story, your background, we have a very quick exercise for all of you. So if you have a piece of paper or, or computer, what I'd like you to do is thinking about your own interest areas and your own, what we've heard about AI and machine intelligence and what we've heard about automation, can you go and think of one area where machine intelligence, artificial intelligence, or some kind of advanced automation may impact your world or perhaps even your, your future line of study? And then, it, so first of all, be able to, in one or two sentences, crisply state the kind of automation or the kind of impact that, that it might have. And then, as we, this is the perils and promises of AI, I think. So state in maybe one or two sentences the promise that this might have, and also some of the dangers or some of the pitfalls or some of the things we should be aware of in that particular area of automated and enhancement. So if you guys can just take, let's, uh, let's go for another, say, five or six minutes. OK, just quickly scribble this down. I know that's not much time to think about such a deep question, but uh, just follow your gut instinct here. And then once you're done, I'll, I'll stop you all, and we'll go through. And everyone can have a couple of minutes on the mic to share what they've come up with. OK, sound good? Have anyone heard about IBM Watson? Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, this is a great example. Now it, uh, it used to be used in the program, US program named Jeopardy. Yeah, two people, uh, are intelligent uh, humans compete with the IBM Watson, but the, it was defeated, defeated by Amy Watson. Now it, now it is using in medical site. Uh, currently using, especially you, in two years ago, it's that study to use in the diagnosis of lung cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, and uh, yeah, and uh, uh, the accuracy is, they have done research about this, the accuracy is much more higher than humans. It is 90%, uh, but for humans, maybe 50%. Uh, when doing diagnosis, uh, our humans are only using the 20% of our, of our knowledge to make a diagnosis, but for Watson, it can ingestion more than 600,000 pieces of medical evidence. And uh, um, um, around, and, and it's almost, <laughs> yeah. Uh, th uh, this is a very good e example in our medical side. Um, and in the future, uh, our doctors maybe also have a risk of losing our jobs, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and a few people in charge of the, uh, in charge of the machines, yeah. and also for the robotic surgery, we, we only need to sit here, and we need to go close to the patients. It's all possible. Yeah. Losing, your, losing your jobs, losing your knowledge, many things. OK, great, thank you. The way I thought artificial intelligence would affect uh, medicine of the future is a lot of the problems in hospitals now is there's a lot of overcrowding, where a lot of doctors and nurses feel completely overworked and they're running from patient to patient. And so I feel like artificial intelligence could take over a lot of the grunt work in which, you know, taking patient history, measuring blood pressures, you know, running regular tests that are run for all patients when they mm -hmm. come in could really be taken over by AIs. Whereas the trained physicians or the trained nurses could really come in when there's something more concrete to go off of. And this would really reduce the burden on healthcare, both financially and in other aspects, you know, uh, less stress for doctors and nurses, so less chance of making mistakes. Uh, but the, the downside to that would be that a lot of medicine relies on the interaction between the doctor and the patient, and a lot of a uh, person's well-being is based on their mental state. So perhaps interacting with robots, even if they're very lifelike, when you know they're not human, it could 
negatively impact the patient's uh, care and well-being, where they could feel like, well, I'm not important enough or I'm not worth enough for a real person to see me, you know, where people feel the sense of anomie, they feel lost, uh, because they largely their interaction would be with these robots, and that could actually uh, impact, negatively impact the patient's health and well-being. So it's kind of a pros and cons, which is difficult to weigh without really knowing what AI can do hmm. at the point. Great, thank you. Uh, as for me, I think now the AI may help me to do the works in the lab, such as cell culture, PCR, waste and Yeah, we can <laughs> we can get get rid of this or of these annoying works, and then I think the AI can also help. Uh, us to file the newest strategies for, you know, for me, uh, it can help me find the newest strategy for tissue engineering, or it can help me to find the newest idea for writing grants or design an experiment properly. Um, I think the downsides, it just make people lazy, uh, uh, um, or lots of people may lose their jobs. Hmm. So, okay. Help you, help you think and design experiments? Uh, <laughs> yeah. No. Okay, so what is concerning my um, field of research is computational biology. Uh, I usually use a lot of um, artificial intelligence tools like uh, neural networks or uh, genetic algorithms and mm -hmm. so on. So I think uh, the best thing that you can do with these tools today is, for example, uh, reduce the time to develop a new drug, just discovering the drug much faster than yeah what you can do in an intensive, an extensive uh, experiment. And another thing that um, it's possible to do, I know, is the, to investigate the protein behavior in physiological and pathological conditions. So understand that, so based on the fact that we cannot like see with a microscope, our protein is uh, uh, changing conformation. We can do it computer by using a lot of artificial intelligence tools. And as well as predicting drug side effects, uh, just using computer. So, I mean, this can reduce, for example, uh, the time for the clinical trials that are really, really long. I think it's 10 years. So I think this is the best promise that it will be, uh, that can be given from the artificial intelligence in my field. Um, I think one of the perils is that these techniques still, for now, they still need a lot of human uh, uh, action at the beginning or in the middle to evaluate because they are not uh, every time good to simulate their, what happened really in the body or in the organism or in the cell or whatever. And another thing that I found that was really exciting is another project I was working on in the past. It was try to classify uh, ca brain cancer in a, in a CT scan. And basically, the artificial intelligence algorithms, they were much better than the human sense to detect. Mm -hmm. For example, it was impossible to detect this small cancer in this organ just by, uh, by looking at the image. But using some uh, artificial intelligence uh, algorithms, we were able to, I mean, I, I saw that it was, it was not simple, but it, it was possible to detect stuff that you cannot see with your human so you can enhance your sense. Okay, thank you. I thought about applications for epidemiology. Yep. We're already using large databases and computers to sort of track where diseases, outbreaks of diseases occur and how they spread. And I'm thinking uh, if that process could be automated with, uh, hypothetically speaking, an infinite storage capacity for data and a really good way to manage that data and integrate connections, we could, we could potentially come up with a really good predictive model for where, when things will occur well ahead, of, uh, well ahead of time. Perhaps if we had a good enough understanding of the environment that these pathogens sort of live in and thrive in, we might even be able to achieve a predictive model of how a mutation might occur in a pathogen, how the pathogen might evolve before it actually evolves. 
that would be really cool because then we could potentially uh, come up with these health policies before we even see the problem. Um, that would be a good thing. And we would have increased security against outbreaks of pathogens and illnesses, especially in this world where people are flying everywhere and sharing their germs, <laughs> essentially. But on the other hand, it might engender complacency. If you don't have infection, there's no public fear. And I mean, a little bit of public fear is a good thing. It sort of speaks to the whole uh, anti-vaccination sphere, which although small, is it, the community thrives still. Um, people are uncertain whether or not vaccines are good for their children because they don't see a problem. I mean, that's just one aspect, but it's an example of where public fear actually is a good thing. Um, it might also develop this sense that there is no threat of new diseases for which there is no data. So we'd have to be alert for things that we've never seen before. Um, and I guess as, as an interesting comment, um, we're already using things like Google and social media to track the spread of diseases well before epidemiologists and public health officials can actually get to it. So, I mean, it'll be interesting to see what comes of that. Um, I <clears throat> thought about uh, the increase in dependency causing a different brand of warfare where um, some positives might be less fatalities and more economically efficient war for the country who's winning. And negatives I haven't really thought about carefully yet. And the positives could also be negatives. Yeah, often the positives can be negatives. That's a very, a very important comment we should put, put in the record books for, that, uh, for this particular discussion. Um, as a student, I thought of education. So we already have the option of taking classes online. And including this class, the lectures are recorded, everything's on YouTube. So we have the option of not coming to class. So what if we take this further and have robots that can substitute our teachers and have automated lessons and machines that can train us lab techniques? And most likely this might have been happening in different parts of the world. Uh, but definitely this will change my uh, life and just the class dynamics in general. So I think uh, some of it's th the promises of having this type of uh, education will be, uh, this type of learning will be making education affordable and accessible to a broader uh, group of people. And, but some of the periods involved would be the distraction of the social environment school provides. Um, but also uh, in coming to school and uh, interacting with our instructors and other students, we have that diversity of thought because uh, we get to hear so many perspectives from people and we get to learn um, about uh, interpersonal skills, leadership, so many other things that are not directly embedded in our course curriculum. So we would lose all of that. And also an, an employment of teachers who are one of the most influential figures in community will be another concern. Yes, so I'll have to stop teaching and do more research. Yes, I think also your comment, I think of our friends in, sur in the surgical robotics area over there who also do some kind of manual training and the, the, uh, the teaching and training you just spoke of impacts their life as well. So um, what I was thinking about was something that was mentioned in our previous AI lectures, and it's an emergent technology in the realm of global public health, and it has to do with using mobile phones in, in mHealth or eHealth. Um, so to expand on that in terms of promise, um, it obviously provides the ability to do things like diagnostic exams, uh, monitor patients. You can have um, telemedicine where you have trained staff communicating with individuals, which is especially relevant when you have um, maybe lower middle income countries that have really poor doctor to patient ratios. Um, you could track epidemic outbreaks and uh, better rally an emergency response. You could have more improved data collection, better education and awareness. I know there's things that encourage um, in relation to maternal health, let's say, um, more antenatal care visits and kind of improved health in that way where you have populations that have access to uh, mobile phones to use this. And uh, obviously this is really relevant in countries where there's less health infrastructure and a greater burden of disease. It could be really relevant. Um, in terms of perils, though, it could actually maybe 
arguably hinder development and progress of the healthcare sector. Um, you're, there's an the issue of accuracy of these things. There's the issue of um, like a legal, a legal framework that it would have to operate by. Um, you have concerns with privacy and um, you know who has access to that data if it's just kind of on the internet. Um, yeah, you have to figure out who would regulate it and obviously population growth would make that really hard to manage. Um, and it could actually still kind of widen a disparity between those who do or don't have access to that technology. Um, but it's a really interesting field that's coming out. So yeah, obviously an area of, of lots of research and things coming out of that. Great, thank you. Did you want to go up and just run up and grab the mic and do yours? Great, thank you. He's leaving his post. I've authorized this. It's okay. No one panic. I think I'm in view here. Yeah, it's okay. I'll just sit here. I, yeah. So I thought a lot about uh, real-time patient profiles, I guess. So if we do anything to like our iPhones, you know, our iPhone immediately knows what we've done to it, and it will, it will update itself with the changes we've made. I thought about what if we increase the efficiency of how we treated and diagnosed patients in hospitals if somehow we were able to go into the hospital and be automatically scanned and perhaps there is some kind of microchip in our body that could monitor the changes that we made to it. So say if a doctor prescribes a new medicine and as soon as we start using this new medicine, this microchip or something will recognize this and it will simply just update our patient profile. So the next time we go in, there's not gonna be any fuss about you know taking a patient history and all this jazz and um, you know, no waste of time there or perhaps even uh, a loss of information if I myself as a patient did not report that I was taking this medication. So then I feel like that would just make diagnosis really more efficient for physicians and uh, other workers in the healthcare field. Uh, I guess the perils of it would certainly be privacy. You know, if we, if we use this data in, I guess, you know, cloud data is such a new emerging thing, if we sync it all to this giant, you know, Alberta Health Services cloud data thing, that just leaves that kind of data open to another possibility of being stolen. Yeah, if you, if you, especially if you think on, even here in the province, we have an excellent electronic medical record system and, and a framework for connecting all of our data from pharmacies. And some people are nodding whether they think it's excellent or not, but we, it is actually world class. And uh, yes, privacy is a huge concern for them and they made sure they do a good job of it. If you start having data in your body and coming out of your body, that's, uh, the privacy is, I think that's a good thing to bring up to end this as well as is, uh, is where the privacy envelope stops. I've always wanted an antivirus chip in my body, but uh, um, okay. Well, great, guys. Thanks so much. I think we should close now and end, so we're with good time. But uh, uh, thank you all very much. If anyone has any extra questions, we can chat afterwards. I think. But uh, anyway, thanks so much. You've all been very. You had all great insights. This was fantastic, and I, I appreciate you all actually being active and sharing all this and and uh, letting me be off the hook for a little while while you guys take the take the microphone. So all right, thanks so much.